often think of markets in terms of bulls or bears. But my next guest says that the wolf is really the correct animal to describe what's going on now. We're joined now by Michael Purvis. He is the head of derivatives research for BGC Partners. Now, prior to joining BDC, uh, Michael was uh, an investment banker for SG Warburg, Merrill Lynch, and RBC Capital Markets. Good to have you with us. Great to be here. Now, I read your report, and it talks about this is the market of the wolf. What do you mean by that? Well, the markets right now are very interesting, and we're going through very interesting times. And what's one of the things that's been happening in these markets over the last several months is that they're not really getting into a clear classic bear trend. They're not getting into a clear bull trend. They're range-bound, they're volatile, and they're dynamic. And a wolf is an animal that's quick, decisive, waits for his prey, and jumps upon it. And that, to my mind, is, was a suitable metaphor for this. So does this mean that we're going to get some kind of correction between now and the end of the year, a pullback in stocks, people selling, and then the market will continue to move higher? I see it. I see it as actually a series of, of uh, volatile movements over the next several quarters. But you're exactly right. I, I did put out a piece last week calling for a near-term correction uh, uh, sometime over the next three weeks. And this is a very interesting point because if a rally precedes an earnings season, as we've seen a year ago or last January and February or last May, April, you typically get met with a pretty nasty correction starting in the third week of earnings. And those can be anywhere from 7 to 10 percent on the broader indices such as the SPX. And that's often accompanied by a big spike in vol of, you know, typically 50 Vol seven. Volatility. Volatility. You can see the Extreme VIX, movements. Yes. You can see the VIX move up from 20 to 30, 35 or even, you know, as high as 48 as we saw last May. Um, very, very quickly. And I think investors of all strategies need to be really, you know, aware of these, of these uh, dynamics in the markets. What role do the midterm elections play in your calculations for the market? Well, it's interesting. You know, I think clearly, you know, the gains the Republicans have been having have been viewed as a market positive. Uh, gridlock, at the very least, is a market positive. But at the end of the day, I personally think that a lot of that, a lot of those ex expectations we're in the September rally. So I look at November 2nd really as more of a sell the news, which, by the way, coincides with, uh, you know, the third week of, er of the broader earnings cycle, and as well as you have on November 3rd, the FOMC meeting, which I think will again be a bit of the sell the, sell the news, because clearly the quantitative easing has been in a very key dynamic in these markets. So do you think that this means investors need to employ slightly more sophisticated strategies in order to extract some earnings from this market? Because if we are going to have this increase in volatility, that would seem as though you've got to use some options, maybe. Exactly. And one of the key, you know, core theses of the wolf market uh, piece I put out in August is that you have to make volatility your friend and not your enemy. So many investors have just been stymied by this volatility. A lot of very, very smart hedge funds got clobbered in May as the market got crushed then and, uh, you know, seemingly out of the blue. And that's what, you know, the framework for these markets that we're in right now. So one of the things that we're doing on our desk is exploiting option strategies and, and two broad ways, one of which is for hedges. And, and again, it's, it's very important to hedge in these markets. To protect your gains. To, to protect your gains, exactly. And to buffer out these big downside moves that are inevitable in these kinds of markets. Um, and, but the key is also to hedge uh, efficiently, because you can't just simply hedge in a static way over and over and over again. Otherwise, you're going to be eating up a lot of alpha or, or return. We're talking about the wolf market with Michael Purvis. He is head of derivatives research for B. BGC Partners. Prior, prior to joining BGC, Michael was an investment banker for SG Warburg. Merrill Lynch, RBC Capital Markets also spent some time on the buy side as well, right? So you've got a little bit of understanding of both the sell and the buy side. Yes, exactly. And uh, when I was on the buy side, I was focused on emerging markets, India and then Latin America. So I've, I've really seen, um, you know, it's been an interesting voyage. I was going to say, you've seen the animal spirits uh, oh, and yes. the animal appetites uh, close up. Right now, now, one of the areas that's a big focus of animal spirits is gold, right? I mean, this has attracted all kinds of investors. What is your work telling you about where gold is headed? Well, you know, I've been talking about gold for about a couple of years now, and I look at gold as one of the things that's actually not in a wolf market. I think it's in a secular uptrend for several years. 
And the reason why is because the, the fundamentals underlying key paper currencies, particularly the U.S. dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound, are deteriorating each and every day. So in my mind, you know, gold has rallied every year against the U.S. dollar and, frankly, against most every major currency over the last 10 years. So the new gold, you know, everyone talks about gold all the time and they see it making a new lifetime high. The actual returns it's been doing this year are really nothing spectacular relative to what it's been doing in the last few years. And so, again, I look at gold as being a great trade and, and, and stocks that are related to gold, for example, gold mining, uh, or silver miners um, have great upside potential because those cash flows will be not correlated with what you're seeing in the in the in the classic equity markets. So would that include companies like a Silver Wheaton, you know, that get royalties uh, and get an income stream from their gold, their, their gold, and in this case, silver mining interests? Right, right. And as you know, silver is one of my uh, uh, pet topics these days, and I think it's a it's got a tremendous move. That's really about a catch up with gold. Uh, yes, and you know uh, what. We We've been, uh, you know, articulating to a lot of clients is is using derivative strategies on companies like Silver Wheaton or, say, for example, the GDX, which is an ETF tracking gold and uh, and some silver miners, um, which give you an outsized risk reward. Um, and, and and again, generating alpha in this market is tricky um, because of the you know this this very high volatility and the lack of fundamental conviction. With gold miners and silver miners, I have high fundamental conviction that those cash flows will continue to improve regardless of what happens in the economy. And that's simply a function of gold prices going up a lot faster than their cost structure. Now, when you talk about derivatives, though, you mean using options, basically using puts and calls in some kind of combination in order to either enhance returns or take advantage of price movements. Exactly. Yes. The options, the, the, the listed options market is a fantastic and I think in some ways underused um, uh, toolkit with which an, which an investor, and it can be a distressed hedge fund, it can be a long only uh, mutual fund, it could be a classic equity long short fund, or a global macro fund. Uh, using options carefully and leveraging this high dynamic volatility to express your fundamental themes is, I think, a very uh, relevant and, 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 and strong way of generating alpha this year and, and, and well into 2011, 2012. For those that always want to generate it but don't know what it is, alpha, what is it? It's really uncorrelated positive performance relative to your benchmarks, be they the S&P or some other uh, benchmark. So it's usually when you open your statement and you say, I just want to know how much money I made. I don't want to know right. how much I lost and did a little bit better than a benchmark that might have fallen even more. This is I just want to make money. Right, exactly. And I think a lot of investors, and whether they're individual investors or money managers, are sick of seeing their P&L being up, you know, 10% one month, down 10% the next, and up 10%. And, and if you use options the right way, you can leverage this enormous dynamic volatility to, to, to really level that out and actually, over the broader term, really outperform. So what about using options for things like exchange-traded funds? I know that there's an exchange-traded fund that focuses on the Indian stock market, for example. Sure. No, that, that absolutely. There's, there's there's uh, across emerging markets, there are a lot of uh, very good, very liquid ETFs, EWZ in Brazil, and uh, as you mentioned, in India, uh, China, we have the FXI, and those are very liquid and very, uh, uh, you know, safe ways to access those markets, and using the options on those uh, ETFs is fantastic. Um, you know, one thing I do want to mention, Pim, is, is clearly that we have to um, look at hedging as an important part of that. And, the, and, and again, hedging, I think the best way to do it is to use the options market for hedging. Right. We're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you very much, Michael Purvis, coming to us from BGC Partners, sharing your thoughts about the hedging and volatility in this market now.